Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Free Marketeers podcast. Thanks for joining us today on our latest episode, a warm afternoon here in Johannesburg. And we were joined by a very special special guest today down uh, in the Western Cape. We are joined by Ivo Fechter. Ivo, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ivo or his work, you can find all of that on The Daily Friend. Ivo is a columnist uh, with The Daily Friend. He covers a wide range of topics, um, and you should go definitely go and check out The Daily Friend website to look up all his work, um, his research. I think uh, it's very useful, especially for those of you who are interested more in the, uh, the empirical and data-driven side of some arguments for the wide position of liberty on all sorts of matters. I would definitely recommend checking out Ivo. I will also link to two of his articles in the description below, and you should also follow him on Twitter. Uh, Ivo, can you just give us your handle before we forget? My Twitter handle is Ivo Fechter, I-V-O-V-E-G-T-E-R. Okay. Ivo Fechter. Please follow Ivo for all the political hot takes uh, that might might make your heart happy. So guys, I thought we would jump in today with Ivo, um, some work that you've been doing for the Free Market Foundation. Um, broadly, the FMF has for a few years been working around the Data Must Fall campaign, the idea that there's a duopoly in mobile network operators and data provision, the idea that data prices in South Africa are exorbitantly high. Um, we've sort of tried to investigate what factors, firstly, whether the data prices are as high as, as is claimed, and secondly, what factors might be involved in possibly driving up those prices from government regulations to other interference to theft, uh, maybe even load shedding, that kind of thing. So, Ivo, I thought we would give you the first word on on your articles you've written for us recently on data prices and spectrum. Yeah, you know, it it it, um, it became very topical again when uh, a few weeks ago, um, or a couple of months ago now, um, the president, Sir Ramaphosa, ordered the communications minister, um, still under Benny Abrahams, um, to bring down mobile data prices by fifty percent by instituting direct controls on retail prices. I mean, this is draconian. This is absolutely goes into full on price controls. You know, this is not just um, a, a, a recommendation to bring down price, uh, data prices or, you know, um, which funny enough, um, mobile operators have done in the past um, recently. I mean, data prices are already significantly lower than they were a few years ago. Um, but instituting price controls like this, well, you know, you're a free marketeer, you know what happens with price controls, right? Either the price is set too high and you end up with a surplus of uh, the good or service in question, or the price is set too low and you end up with a shortage because nobody's willing to produce it when, uh, when, when they can't make a profit doing it. So you basically unbalance supply and demand, which is something that the market tries very hard not to do. Um, so this is a really, really bad idea. Um, now, the question then, are data prices too high? Look, I'm a consumer, right? Um, any data price is too high for me. I want my data to be free. Right? I want as much data as I can eat right? at incredibly high speeds, um, and I don't want to pay anything for it. Right? That's my starting position in negotiations. Right? For someone who supplies me with data, the opposite is true, all right? They want to charge as much as possible for their data, right? And want to give me as little of it as possible, right? Because that way it costs them as little as possible and as profitable as possible. Now, somewhere in between, we need to come to an agreement. Um, so the question then becomes, is the agreement that we currently have with our data providers, uh, is that too high? And we're looking specifically at, at mobile data, um, 4G data. Um, I always have a feeling that it is, you know, I. I I feel cramped with my with my mobile data plan. It's it's uh, I don't have a, great, a very high cap. Um, the speeds are okay, but um, you know I always use Wi-Fi at home rather than uh, rather than using using my four G data signal. Um, so maybe it is too high. But then you look at the look at the actual facts behind it, and you start thinking about well, why are data prices the way they are in South Africa? Um, the first thing is South Africa is very far from the rest of the world. Right. It is probably as far as you can get from the rest of the world. Right. We have massive undersea cables that run to Europe, or run to, to uh, the Middle East. Um, I think there's one running to India. Um, we're just far away from everywhere. And so you, you have a, a massive cost to bring the internet to South Africa in the first place using these undersea cables, of which we only have a handful. There's about half a dozen, I think. Um, I'm not sure at last count. Um, secondly, South Africa has a very low population density. 
Right? So if you look, start looking at data prices in various countries and you correlate it to population density, uh, you find that places that are that have higher population density have lower data prices. And that makes a lot of sense because you need less network to reach all those people. It's much easier you know, to put up one tower and talk to a thousand people that surround that tower than to deal with, you know, a, a, a very spread out population where there's only a hundred people around each tower. So you need to put, ten to put up 10 times as many towers. So from that perspective, um, South Africa really isn't, isn't that expensive uh, compared to its peers. Um, and so, so whether the government really is addressing a problem that exists, I'm not sure that they are addressing it in absolutely the wrong way and a very damaging way, I am sure. Because the only, the only thing that's going to happen with, with price controls, it's quite simple. The mobile companies aren't going to take that out of their profits. Right? They are going to take that out of investment in, in infrastructure. Right? Um, they're going to, basically, they're going to offer, they're going to offer um, uh, low data speeds. They're going to offer a lot of dropped calls and so on, which is already happening in our cities. Um, yeah, out in the country where I am, I'm actually quite lucky with 4G because there's not a lot of people on 4G networks. And then the people that are here are generally old and they just use Facebook and WhatsApp. So, you know, I'm cool. But in the cities, uh, whenever I've traveled to Joburg uh, or Cape Town, I notice that there's so much contention. The speeds are much slower. Um, it's sometimes hard to get onto the network. And that's just going to get worse because they're going to stop investing in their networks. Why would they invest in a network where they can't set their prices to, to pay for it? Um, instead of going to Nigeria or you know some other market where they can make money um, on their own terms, so they're going to focus all their investment on uh, on foreign networks and cut down on their investments in South African networks. That's going to be the outcome of price controls on on data company. Okay. On the topic of price controls and sort of controlling consumer behavior, or for bureaucrats and central planners thinking they can control consumer behavior. I just wanted to highlight that new data from the National Income Dynamics Coronavirus Rapid Mobile Survey recently estimated that 85% of smokers continued smoking during the South African government's lockdown ban on the sale of cigarettes. Um, and the survey that was published uh, earlier this week, I think on the 17th of Feb, it showed that only 8% of South Africans quit smoking during the ban. And half of those who quit indicated they started smoking again when the ban was lifted. And on the subject of prices, uh, external price data adjusted for inflation and expressed in, con in constant November 2020 prices showed that the average price of cigarettes increased by nearly 200% between 2017 and its highest point during the sales ban uh, with substantial geographical variation in those prices. Now, Zakes, you've done work sort of about the Competition Commission, how it thinks it can control, for example, the price of ginger um, and was it garlic, I think, garlic, yeah. and garlic. So I wanted you to expand a bit on what Ivo touched on just uh, around supply and demand, price signals, you know, if, why if I, politicians and bureaucrats fall into the trap of thinking if they tell people you can't buy X or you can't produce X, it's just going to fix things. It's, it's, Chris, can I, can I just add something to what you said? Yeah, please do. Um, I, I didn't quit smoking when the ban was, uh, was imposed. I, at one point, paid 2,700 Rand for a carton that would normally cost me 200 Rand. Uh, um, that was before the black market really got, uh, got competitive and, and prices started dropping significantly again. Um, I didn't stop smoking. Um, I did stop smoking a week ago, so I'm vaping now. Right? But uh, no thanks to the government for that one. Uh, the government's ban certainly didn't convince me to stop smoking. In fact, I felt during the ban, I felt less inclined to quit smoking simply because I didn't want to do what uh, Dlamini Zuma told me to do. I, I agree anyway, with you sorry, right there. Like, sorry, I, interrupted, I interrupted you. No problem, no problem. A lot, of, a lot of smokers during the ban felt like smoking was, you know, a form of protest action. So I can agree with that. I don't know of a lot of people who did quit. And it just speaks to, you know, Chris's questions about you know, governments operate on intentions, really, irrespective of, like, the consequences that their intentions may have. So the intention of the state inherently, as you were said, as a consumer, I want the lowest prices at the highest quantities for the goods that I want. And the government, when it intimates to represent the interests of consumers, approaches any economic scenario like that about wanting to at least constantly 
reduce prices but as, as we know scarcity is not contingent on our feelings on our intentions and our policy directives really so scarcity usually is the one that comes into play and in my articles are try to explain this to the government that price controls just don't work they, they 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 work formally in the sense that you may have a formal price of a certain good at a particular at a particular point, but it's either, as, as Ivo said, the, 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 the supply of said good mm -hmm. becomes way too much because the price maybe was too high and no one can inherently afford it, or it's too low and, you know, the supply dries up, if not, the quality drops. So I don't think the, the government quite understand the economic implications of their price control. Not only that, they do not achieve the ends that they seem that they want to achieve, right? I would assume that we're wanting to lower data prices. They would want more people to be able to access the internet, but by doing so, less people will be able to access it if less in if less companies invest in their infrastructure rollout. Not only that no new entrant would be motivated to come into the space because the profitability levels would be not dictated mm -hmm. by your ability to satisfy people's preferences as it comes to like, you know, wireless communication, but really will be contingent on their government's whims. So it's, it's, it's a confused paradigm, really, mm. in my estimation. Ivo, it's very sort of Soviet era thinking, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. It's, it's uh, you know, and it's strange because when you go back in, in history, you know, I covered the telecoms policy in this country. I became a technology journalist in 1993, which was pretty much when they came up with the original telecoms policy for the country, realizing that in a new democracy, um, communication would be key to realizing people's rights, um, you know, constitutional rights to, to political participation and so on. Um, so they came up with these ideas. And in 1995, they gave telecom a monopoly. Um, I, I remember being at that meeting at the Carlton Center in uh, the, the Carlton Hotel in, um, in Joburg when uh, AT&T and a, a bunch of international investors were in that meeting and they you know, were dead keen to invest um, millions, even billions in South Africa. And they walked out because they'd just given Telcom a monopoly. Now, at the time, the thinking was... Um, well, landlines are important and we're going to use landlines to reach the underserviced masses, right? So that's why telecom needs a monopoly. And in return for its monopoly, it's got a mandate to, to, um, to put in a million new landlines. I'm not sure why only a million, because our population is significantly larger than that. Um, but that was their mandate. Meanwhile, the government had given licenses for mobile phones to Vodacom and MTN. Uh, the thinking there was that mobile phones are basically a toy for the rich. Um, the government didn't really care about that because they never were going to provide universal connectivity. Um, they, they sell maybe half a million units each. Right? That was the thinking. Even the, even the mobile companies expected about a half a million, maybe a million um, mobile connections each. Of course, we now know that that's not true. Um, there's now something like 1.7 mobile connections per person in this country. Um, you know, and, and it's, uh, the number of mobile connections has climbed dramatically. Um, when our, our mobile companies ran up, you know, when telecom ran up against the problem of people not being able to pay, they sent out the debt collectors and they cut off the phone lines, right? Those million lines that they had to install, they did install them, and then they promptly cut them off for non-payment. Um, telecom didn't have any idea what to do about, about that. Um, and to this day, I believe, if you want to telecom landline, you need to be, they, they check your credit record. You need to be credit worthy to get a telecom account. Um, what the mobile companies decided was, look, we don't care about your credit record, right? Just pay us in advance. Simple. So they invented pay as you go. They, prevent, they, they invented prepaid to deal with the fact that you had a market where credit worthiness was not something that was universal was, you know, very few people had a good credit record. So, so they brought prepaid into the market and it worked like an absolute dream. They, they went all over South Africa, all over Africa. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone these days without a mobile phone or access to a mobile phone. It might not be a fancy phone, but they'll have one. Anyone with a job in this country will have a mobile phone, right? Uh, it's, and, and that's all thanks to the mobile companies. That's all thanks to the free market, right? Even though there were only two companies competing, uh, the free market achieved this with, with Telcom, the government's monopoly, um, failed dismally in its, in its mandate. 
So, yeah, no, the, the, the socialist or Stalinist way of thinking of government control, central planning, um, we've got so much evidence that it doesn't work. Uh, I think part of, well, I'm speaking on their behalf, so part of the motivation behind the, the sort of plan to control prices is wanting to reach this utopian state. A lot of, I think a lot of statist policies, whether from the, the left or the right, tend towards some sort of utopia, but a lot of these price controls tend towards the perfect state of competition because, for example, the line will be that Vodacom and MTN have too much of the market share, so we need to make sure that we control the prices and at what uh, sort of level these companies set prices so we can reach perfect competition now zakes could we ever reach perfect quote-unquote competition <laughs> this is the thing right perfect competition would be in a market that is not regulated at all by the state right? okay. like even the idea of planning competition from the top down makes minimal sense right because even if let's say in the pencil making market, right? Uh, was the Stadler or any other mm -hmm. stationary, stationary making company is dominant. Since there aren't any government regulations stopping people from entering said market, even if Stadler can be as dominant as it wants, its position of dominance is premised on it satisfying people's needs and preferences. Right, right. So like the idea of perfect competition comes from competition theory. And for there to even be something like competition theory is, is the assumption that the state since all laws are considered within the status paradigm in like a nation state really so the the, 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 the the assumption is that the state should be the one to create these conditions of competition which is why i'm also opposed to this idea every time particularly people i who argue for like free markets and everything saying the government must create the environment like the government does nothing really all we needed to do is to stop doing stuff that automatically will create more competition just like Nival's example right if the government did not have a monopoly on issuing out licenses for example for like to mta and vodacom mm -hmm. and anyone who has the capabilities and the capital to essentially homestead on the either and establish a connection and have that connection recognized as a private property right could be able to do so then you won't have the problem of there being an analog or duopoly as the currently is and even if there is the duopoly would not be contingent as it currently is on status regulations but rather would be contingent on these companies actually satisfying the preferences of these consumers so the idea of creating competition is the most confused really theoretical supposition that is prevalent particularly in mainstream public policy the idea that the government can inherently do anything but destroy is the most confused idea to me. Uh, Ivo, I'd like you to comment on that. And also just, I mean, to me, I've always understood it that a monopoly for a, a monopoly can only arise when it's government protected. So for example, with ESCOM being only the only entity allowed to provide electricity, to me, a monopoly requires government sort of protection and enforcement. If it's if you had if you have a competitive free market, then there'll always be competition, even if it doesn't exist at that specific point in time. The point is that people won't be prevented sort of from coming in and competing with that big player. So what what do you what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I mean, look, I entirely agree that, that, you know, government has never furthered any enterprise, but by the alacrity with which it got out of the way. Um, you know, the, the irony here is that the government created the market in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, you know, cell phones and uh, telecommunications. They were the ones that gave, gave Telcom a monopoly. They were the ones that issued only two licenses in, in 1993 for, for mobile phones. They were the ones that said, all right, we're going to have a third cellular operator. Uh, not multiple new cellular operators because there were multiple applicants uh, for that license. No, no, no. We're going to handpick one uh, who we think is going to do a good job to compete with MTN and Vodacom. Well, that company, um, which we all know is Cell C, uh, innovatively named because it was C is the third letter in the alphabet. Um, that company uh, gave a bit of competition for a while and, and competed on price and so on, but it's largely failed. And, and it's been financial uh, uh, straits now for, for many, many years. And it's now decided that it's going to completely dismantle its own network and will piggyback on um, the Vodacom or MTN networks. Right, so it's basically dead in the water. The same with the competition to, to Telcom. There was going to be a second national operator after Telcom's monopoly was lifted. Right, now, that monopoly was lifted in 2000, 2001, somewhere around there. Um, 
it took another five or six years before they finally got around to licensing the second national operator, right? Neotel. Right? Well, we all know what a glorious behemoth Neotel became and how much competition they gave Telcom. Right? They are now part of Liquid Telecom. Uh, they were acquired because they were worth basically nothing. Um, you know, it, government can't create competition. What they need to do is just stop limiting the number of licenses you issue for anything, right, for a start. Right? If, if somebody wants to do something and they meet the criteria, um, you know, I, I can understand issuing licenses because you want them to meet regulatory criteria. You know, liquor licenses are a good example. Um you know, if they want to stop them from selling to children, selling to selling near schools, selling near churches, whatever, you know, you, um, you, you, you issue licenses, but don't limit the number of licenses, right? Anyone who comes and qualifies, right, should get a license. And the same goes for telecoms companies, right? Anyone who comes and qualifies should get a license. Um, that's how you create competition, right? You don't cut down the successful companies because you're right, in a free market, if there is a monopoly or if there is what seems like a monopoly, if there's a dominant player, Right. That is because they supply the market better than anyone else. Right? If they didn't, people would leave to smaller competitors. Right? And you know, big dominant companies attract competition. You know, they, they you know, IBM was dominant for I don't know 20, 30 years. Right? Everyone thought uh, you know you can't go wrong buying IBM. Um, that was the mantra everywhere. Right? Look what happened now. Where's IBM now? You know, Microsoft killed it on on on, uh, on the desktop platform. Uh, Apple killed it. Uh, Unix, Linux killed it. You know, IBM is still a reasonable IT company, but it's certainly not the dominant behemoth that it used to be. Microsoft used to be dominant. Look what happened now. Like we've got Linux running on just about every server in the world. Yeah, it's um, monopolies tend to take care of themselves in a free market. You know, as soon as companies stop delivering what people want. What people want from these companies, then people will start leaving them. Look at MultiChoice; they're complaining that people are leaving them, which is I, actually it's a lie. But um, you know, all they have to do is look at the quality of their own product. Um, if people are leaving them, that's because they're finding a better product somewhere else, um, and that's exactly how the market should operate. It's not up to government to say, "Well, we've got to cut you down, we've got to cut your prices, we've got to force you to improve the quality of your product." or whatever. The government can't control that sort of thing. Um, the market can. I have one sort of subtopic on our broader discussion that I definitely wanted to get your views on. And before I forget was around, you know, something that people are talking, have been talking about for the last few years is the spectrum auction and President Ramaphosa and other ministers and bureaucrats and politicians, they often talk about the fourth industrial revolution and smart cities and all these grand plans. But meanwhile, we can't even move from analog to digital so what is the current situation with the spectrum auction obviously that's linked to services such as 5g that we're told we'll get at some point i think the latest smartphones coming out this year the new samsung for example is 5g capable but who knows if we'll get 5g in south africa yeah look that's a big problem because the spectrum available to companies right now is pretty saturated um now we've been promised the spectrum for i don't know a decade or so Right. We were initially going to make a switch to digital terrestrial television. I think the deadline was 2011 was the original deadline. Um, I might be wrong. It might have been earlier than that. Right. Um, and at the time, I wrote, because the government, again, had a monopoly. They decided they're going to design the set-top box that's going to be used for digital television. And they, they gave out a few tenders and so on. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to be such a mess. Right. You can buy dirt cheap decoders. Right, from China right now. But no, they wanted to create a, a domestic electronics industry, and, you know, save Telljoy in the process. You know, I don't know if you remember Telljoy. Uh, they used to rent televisions back in the day. You could rent a, you could rent a television and a VHS machine from Telljoy. Um, and, and people did that, you know. So it's sort but, of a uh, local, yeah. proudly South African kind of campaign. Yeah, basically. So we ended up with overpriced uh, uh, decoders that are shirt quality that ended up sat, sat in warehouses because, you know, the government couldn't figure out how to distribute them. And um, because of all that, they couldn't switch off the analog signal because there were too many people still dependent on the analog signal for um, for their, for their, their free-to-air television. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a mess. But anyway, we, we, 
it looks like there is now a chunk of bandwidth that's available and it's, it should have been auctioned off for 2016 or so. Uh, it's now only five years later and it looks like it'll be on the auction block. Um, well, they said in March, um, I'm going to take that to mean before September, perhaps. Um, Telcom is now suing uh, the government to stop that auction because um, oh, they have some really terrible argument about um, uh, you know the proper use of, of that of that bandwidth, even though they actually own the most spectrum of any company in South Africa. Um, so hopefully that matter will be dealt with soon, and we actually will get a spectrum auction. Um, and that look once once there's more spectrum, um, that reduces the cost basis for 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 data products. So then we might actually get some data uh, data prices going down. We'll certainly get more vigorous competition between the, the various operators. Even last year during the lockdown, the fact that, um, was it a car, so correct me if I'm wrong, Ivor, but mobile network operators were given emergency, <laughs> quote unquote, emergency spectrum. And then they were told at some point it'll be taken away from them. So the fact that in the sort of emergency situation, it shows you the spectrum is there, but then it was yeah. arbitrarily like, because they were said, imagine then that you're in the position of the mobile network operator, you invest in new infrastructure and towers and stuff. And then you get told, oh no, at some arbitrary point, the, the new spectrum will be taken away. Well, then who's going to use it? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, makes, it makes no sense. But yeah, they've been sitting on that spectrum for, for ages. It's just right. that they, ICASA just hasn't had the, the capacity really to deal with, with, uh, with allocating it and auctioning it. You know, so yeah, every, and every, time, every time it ends up under legal review because, mm. you know, the regulators just doesn't have the capacity for, for, for doing that. But that's the thing with central planners. Central planners don't have capacity. You're never going to have a central planner that, that knows how these things work, that knows who should be getting the spectrum, who can make the best use of it. Um, they don't. The answer is simple. The person who pays the highest price for it has, knows how to use it best. Mm -hmm. right? If they don't, if they can't make money out of it, well, then their only option is to sell it to someone who does know how to use it. Um, that's how the market allocates stuff to, to the person who, who can best use um, spectrum. And that's how it should work. If it, if, even with that, right? Like, I guess an auction is is a much more better step than having you know monopolized spectrum and it's being granted on a basis of licensing and everything like that. Although I guess an auction will give the company a a a, a prima facie license over that particular band. Mm -hmm. My my general thinking when it comes to spectrum, right, is why why does the government even get to have a monopoly over spectrum? Mm -hmm. Just as you said, that telecom like, probably owns the the, the 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 biggest amount of spectrum out of any company in in the country and only that on a global scale states seem to own the most amount of spectrum all across the world mm -hmm. and they seem to cordon it off on an arbitrary basis to the citizens and we all know that the market is the most is the best way to to, to essentially assign efficient uses to scarce goods and services and spectrum is a scarce good in and of itself so i don't understand really why we can't seem to have private property rights in spectrum right rather than these licenses too and back on your earlier point on, on licensing you're like you know licensing for 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 for, for stuff like liquor licenses mm. is understandable the basic premise of a of a market of a, of a market transaction is a trade between two voluntarily interacting individuals and a license by natural operation of fact is a third party intervention mm. on that voluntary interaction between two individuals so we cannot then say that it can be necessary in any context in a market context it is not economically sound it is unjust because it is an unjustified intervention between a contract between two people right so even the idea right that for any for, for, for one to start a business they first have to get a license I truly don't agree with because mm. it gives the impression that for one to exercise their constitutional right which is freedom of trade and everything else they first need to go kiss the ring of the state when the when the state inherently derives its power from people exercising their rights and constituting themselves in whatever manner they may deem fit so the issue of having spectrum being the sole preserve of the state is extremely troubling and it is much more prevalent in the telecommunications industry because the moment you so have should people, should people be allowed should people be allowed to drive without driver's licenses precisely 
<laughs> should they be should they be forced to take out insurance no one should be forced to do anything <laughs> no one should be forced to do anything but this is, people should be allowed the only uh, you see, the only way you, you can see, use state power that's the thing the only way you can use state power is if i'm violating someone's rights mm -hmm. right so if i'm driving whether with a license or not I can, I'm not violating anyone's rights. And even beyond that, the implication of having licenses for driving is that people won't drive without licenses. But if people still drive, even though there's a regulation that you must have a license for you to drive and people are still able to drive without a license, then it already undercuts the end of licensing, right? <laughs> because it means that the, 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 the evil you want to get rid of is still there, irrespective of whether there's a regulation. No, no, so the regulation right. does minimal impact really on the evil that you want to deal with. And this is prevalent in licensing, whether in liquor laws or anything like that, P, uh, uh, minors still buy alcohol in in most townships in most townships really even with said liquor liquor regulations and the same goes with the most of other licenses so when it comes to the actual substance of a license it makes minimal it makes minimal impact on dealing with the end of, on the end that it wants to deal with rather than imposing more costs on someone no, who's not violating anyone's rights Look, it does. It does. Give, it does give you a means to deal with it. You know, you can yank someone's license if they're caught if they're caught selling to 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 minors. Um, you know, and then and then if they sell without a license, you can arrest them. But that's it. Um, it, it just gives it gives a means to deal with deal with issues. Look, I'm a minarchist. I'm not. An I'm not an anarchist. Um, you know, I do believe in a in, in a small government. Um, and I do believe that certain regulations, a minimal set of regulations, um, you know, can be justified. Mm -hmm. um, what is the justification? We're, we're, we're not going to get into an abstract philosophical <laughs> debate now, even though we will have that one day between the anarchist and, like, the, and the minimal like state. Your, Sorry, I like Arago. your idealism, and in theory, you're right. <coughs> but but I'm a lot. I'm I'm a, bit, I'm a bit more. The older I get, the more pragmatic I get about these sort of things. We're not allowed to say the P word on the podcast. We can say anything else except that except uh, that other P word. <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatism is how is is how we slowly move down the road. To is how we justify is how we justify tyranny. Precisely. <laughs> Okay, our second and final topic before we get into the philosophical and two abstract weeds, um, I wanted to get Zaix's view on a recent submission that he did for the FMF that, that is on the FMF uh, website, or it will be soon, and I'll also link to it in the description below. So Zaix, can you talk a bit about the submission, what it handled on, and um, just sort of the implications of it? Oh, uh, yeah, the submission was on the draft right paper released by the Department of Communications, I think, on audio and audiovisual content services. So the, the, the policy inherently seems to want to aggregate the entire content delivery industry, if we were to call it that, the entertainment industry in South Africa, okay. with the whole with audiovisual being what we used to be called broadcasting, I think, in a previous legislation. Mm -hmm. So it wants the traditional broadcasters with the SABC, ETV, multi-choice, and these new entrants with Netflix and everyone to be regulated under a single regulatory framework, basically. Okay. And you know, the, 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 the regulations outside of that, you know, having them under a single regulatory framework is a good thing, but a major talking point from said regulations would have been the imposition of the local content quotas that traditional broadcasters are bound by in South Africa on these international, uh, what they call over the top delivery services, right? With uh, Netflix and Hulu. Right. So if these, if this policy is to be adopted, that's to be released, uh, if, if the policies to be adopted, uh, these companies would now have to also comply with the 2016, I think, ICASA regulations on local content, which put an imposition on companies to produce a certain amount of local content as their overall library and to broadcast it at certain hours so that they make sure that people watch it. It's, it's, it's a very confused, you know... <laughs> It's a it's, 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 it's statism taken to its logical conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that you can plan people's lives right down to what they consume when it, when it comes to art, right? And anyone who, who loves art like I do will know that it's a highly subjective mm -hmm. concept in and of itself, right? You can't find art theorists agreeing on what art is. And then you have the government trying to impose the... Mm -hmm. The, the, the entertainment that it's that that its citizens ought to consume so that that was arguably the most the major 
talking point out of the entire policy is this imposition of these regulations on these companies that inherently should not have them right because mm. the argument from the government is that south africans are in need of local content and i'm like if south africans were in need of local content then south africans would patronize companies that produce local content mm -hmm. for the mere fact that they have chosen to patronize companies that have no local content on their content libraries already undermines the whole ideal of the government that they're doing this for people's sake right like there's no way you can know what is good for me outside of me making the decision myself so it's a very tyrannical understanding of the entire thing and the entire thinking from government of wanting to create regulatory parity because i think was it mouth choice i think Evo mentioned that mouth choice was saying people are leaving it for its competitors so mm -hmm. I think it was multi-choice who started maybe lobbying the state and trying to create regulatory parity and right. regulatory parity according to status is imposing new regulations on companies that have found an innovative model to try and bypass them and satisfy people's preferences in the market and my idea of regulatory parity is that the local content quotas should have been removed for the traditional broadcasters sure. then they'd be operating on a normal footing with all these international players then they can decide to broadcast whatever they want but rather than a deregulatory approach to creating regulatory parity the policy really seems to be imposing a whole lot of regulations on you know not only companies too but the potential in, in, in of regulating even youtubers right mm -hmm. if, if if you're a youtuber mm -hmm. and you are big enough to pass the threshold which is quite arbitrary in itself of influence that the government has introduced in the policy itself right like i think there's there's influence and then there's the amount of turnover and everything like that but of course with youtubers you can't necessarily get your turnover mm -hmm. so if a youtuber were to get big enough and the government would decide that they have a big enough influence then they would be required to apply for either an individual or a class license and if they don't apply for said licenses the government can impose duties on said either individual or company that chose not to apply for it as if they had said licenses so it's a it's a very tyrannical attempt at regulating what ought to be a free endeavor which is entertaining oneself so it's crazy Ivo, I'm sure you you want some uh, SABC produced movies and series on your Netflix uh, when you log in on your homepage. Oh, well, I can get those for free on the SABC. <laughs> Don't they put all their stuff on YouTube? Actually, interestingly enough, I think a lot of SABC series are on YouTube. Yeah, oh, that's about that's, a, that's what my tax money pays for. All the free, all the free local content on SABC. But you, you know what? The, the whole theory behind this is wrong. Um, and and frankly, this is this is multi choice. This is not so much the government. Um, I mean, the, the government is, is, is quite inclined to regulate in, in this sort of manner, but this is multi-choice asking for this. And the weird thing is that multi-choice at the moment has a library of uh, 59,000 hours of local content, right? Um, it claims that its local content quota is about 37% right now, which is significantly higher than it is required to produce under its, uh, under its license. It says that its strategy, right, the CEO, Cal Calvo Mawela, said it plans to take on Netflix with a new hyper-local content strategy, right, not only in South Africa, but throughout Africa, right, um, in local languages and so on. They want to push the 37% local content up to 45%. Um, you know, this is exactly what it should be doing to compete, find a way to differentiate itself, right? And if it can, if it can grab a, a large part of the, of the sort of local language market in, in South Africa, Nigeria, the other African countries, you know, it's not going to get outcompeted by Netflix, right? And this is exactly what it should be doing. So it, it, it isn't a problem that local content isn't available because local content is available. Multi-choice is working very hard to make more of it available. Um, the SABC is producing a lot of local content, right? Why you need to force Netflix to produce local content is completely beyond me. DSTV in 2020 had 8.7 million active subscribers in South Africa. Right? Netflix had 338,000. Right? So there are 26 DSTV subscribers for every Netflix subscriber in South Africa. Right? So the argument that Netflix is taking business away from multi-choice is absolute rubbish. Um, the argument that it's going to make massive, a massive difference to the local content availability if Netflix produces local content or is forced to produce local content is also nonsense. 
right? Um, you know, people will just choose not to watch it. It all it does is it it it, it loads extra costs onto Netflix. Right? Now, if you're multi-choice, right? What would you like the government to do to your competitors? Right? You want you want the government to force your competitors to increase their costs, right? To increase regulations that you are already meeting, right? And force them to meet the same to meet the same hurdles, right? So it is purely anti-competitive behavior by multi-choice. It is shameless. Um, you know, and multi-choice isn't struggling. You know, they say they're struggling, but they're not. I oh, say, oh, people are leaving DSTV Premium. Um, you know, well, yeah, sure. Average revenue per user is declining, and in, in multi-choice, although there's massive growth in its in its mass market offerings. You know, it's it's cheaper offerings. Um, but you know, it made. I've got a note here somewhere. Um, it reported 3.5 billion rand in after-tax profits for the first half of the 2020-2021 financial year, right? After tax profit, right? Now, this is a year, it's, that's up 50% from a year earlier, right? And this is a year with lockdown, right? All their hotel customers, all their all their their, their pubs and, and restaurants and so on, all these, these public places that have DSTV, right? They all uh, lost all that income because those, those guys shut down. Um, sports, there was no more sports. Right, so they lost a lot of income because of the sport channels having to show documentaries or old matches. Uh, you know, so in a terrible year, in a terrible pandemic year, right? These guys increased their profits by fifty percent, right, to three point five billion rand. They, they are not struggling, right? So the, the notion that they can go to Ikasa and say, "Oh, oh, so you know, woe is me. We have to meet these content regulations." And, and YouTube and, and Netflix don't, and this is unfair on, on poor us. It's absolutely disgusting. You know, it's absolute rubbish. It, it's, you know, it's again, it's a government messing where, where it's not supposed to be messing. And frankly, it's a government protecting a special interest. And in this case, uh, a large new monopoly um, against, against competition. The problem with multi-choice is that its premium package starts at uh, 800 and 19 rand, I believe. Um, whereas Netflix's premium package costs 169 rand. Right? That's the problem. So if MultiChoice wants to address Netflix as a competitor, well, maybe they should lower their prices. Maybe they should start competing. Maybe they should, they should start offering fresh new shows instead of reruns of old shows that everyone's seen before because they came out in, in 2011. Um, it's 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 absolute nonsense. The whole thing. Um, the, the the broadcast sector does not need more regulation. It needs a lot less. The whole sorry, just before you go on, I was just going to mention the local content push and idea. To me, it's you know it's a very sort of empty understanding or uh, application of patriotism and local pride to think that the government forcing companies to produce local content is somehow going to make South Africans prouder of what their country produces. To me, when the state forces us to do anything. I don't really see an increase in sort of patriotism and pride in our own abilities and in our citizen, our fellow citizens abilities. It feels very like artificial to me. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it does. It does. And going back to like, I will point about, you know, multi the reason multi choices are monopolies because of government regulations, as you said, because of the government policy of granting, you know, licenses under very specific conditions mm -hmm. that a whole lot of people are, un are unable to meet mm -hmm. and the government to try and solve this problem should rather deregulate or scrap their entire licensing system. I don't get the idea that you first need permission from the state mm. to be able to broadcast, to be able to send a message to anyone else. And the internet has created a medium whereby you bypass the entirety of that overgrown bureaucracy. And the government is trying to bring that bureaucracy into a new and innovative model really, rather than trying to kill the bureaucracy that's stifled the broadcasting industry globally, right? Because mm -hmm. this is a global standard, what the right. South African government has been doing, whereby you grant interest to broadcasters and it, which inherently results in creating ol ol oligopolies that new entrants cannot enter at all unless they have crazy capital requirements, which is why net companies like Netflix and Hulu were even invented or started to begin with us because this problem is a problem that's prevalent all across the world. The mm. government has created conditions with this monopolization of spectrum, mm. be it in telecommunications or in broadcasting in this instance, 
by, by, by essentially giving it to a few amount of people and hoarding a large majority of it. And then companies find innovative ways to still provide entertainment to, 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 to their consumers. And the government's response to that is to burden these companies way more with these regulations. And I will say this, it was multi-choice lobbying really that got the government to do this because multi-choice has been complaining about Netflix ever since Netflix became a player in the South African market, right? And to think that a company that already enjoys regulatory protection in the space that it operates in due to the sheer amount of costs that the regulation alone, right? If I'm a new entrance, the, reg the regulatory costs are a startup cost and mm -hmm. for multi-choice, they're just a cost they can pass on to the consumer really because they're already established. So the fact that a company that is already protected by the state would want to lobby the state to protect it even more shows a very, very <sighs> perverted, outlook into how they want to operate in the market but i couldn't i don't necessarily want to blame because the, the the executive of multi-choice would seek any avenue to maximize sure. the returns for for his shareholders the problem lies with the state mm. the state cannot bend to the whim of any private interest that mm. seeks to use its monopoly on force for their yeah. own benefits right so like the 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 the, the the Department of Communications should have just told MultiChoice that it's not going to regulate the, these new entrants. Actually, it's going to deregulate the space that MultiChoice already operates in, so as to create competition in that very same space, right? Like the reason that MultiChoice has such a wide monopoly over or, or over entertainment, not only in Southern Africa but in Africa in, in general, is because these regulations benefited mm -hmm. because it was a first entrant it was one of the first people to get licenses when they were given commercially to commercial and to, to, to commercial interests and like you have for one to get a license you have to meet certain specific thresholds right so no it will be happy because you no know, licensing somehow benefits us in some <laughs> very weird way but you know the the, the that's uh, strong man <laughs> <laughs> an economic understanding of licensing as i've already outlined it just sees it's, it's an absurd it's an inefficient yeah. use of resources right you will now have this capital that is redirected to paying lawyers to paying a whole bunch of people who are in here who are just not necessary at all to delivering an end product to the consumer so yeah the the, the policy was extremely bad it was on multiple fronts yeah. too right because it still perpetuated this ideal that the government is responsible for granting licenses for broadcasting and i'm like we have the freedom to express ourselves guaranteed in the constitution right and the ideal that for me to be able to express myself and broadcast however i may deem fit i first have to get permission from the state is at odds even with our current constitutional jurisprudence but it is considered within a status paradigm of course and i'm sure there are a lot of professors who would argue with either that oh no without licensing would have you know the chaos of the free markets and and people selling and people selling alcohol to children without licenses and all that but you know i, I think that the approach they should have taken really you know with this draft white paper of theirs was to argue for deregulation even though in some aspects they do say that some some sectors will have to be deregulated the deregulation only happens in sectors that they deem will protect for interest the SABC, right? I think right. current with legislation, I know there's some demarcation because the government is makes arbitrary laws like that whereby the SABC cannot partake in certain activities because those activities are reserved for commercial broadcasters or anything like that. So their ideal of regulations to inherently remove those restrictions on companies that are already currently participants in the market rather than looking for a way to actually stimulate the growth of the market by deregulating it and just allowing people to get the entertainment wherever they deem fit because the government could institute a hundred percent quota on local content and if i don't want to watch local content i just don't watch it yeah, yeah. so it's it's, it's this it, it then shows that they do not have an interest really in the substantive sense in what i in creating national identity as the policy said but they are more concerned with a particular form of national identity that they get to dictate to other people irrespective of whether it will even have the effect that is desired or not so it's, it's a horrible policy overall hopefully the department of like really relooks it and you know goes over our submissions i doubt they will because once they have their their, their mindset on something it's pretty hard to change but it's a horrible policy and it was horrible acting 
it, it was a horrible action on multi-choice parts to even lobby for the states to do something like this. It's no. it's bad all around. Uh, Ivo, any any sort of last parting thoughts on on either of our two main topics today, or any other pearls of wisdom that you wanted to leave with us and the and the listeners? Any uh, liberty insights that you might have that will give someone a Damascus moment? <laughs> no, oh, no. Other than other than uh, you know, this is this is what multi choice is doing. Is it is a typical strategy from big business, right? If you, if you're if you're a big business, you're an established firm, um, and and uh, you know you serve your customers and so on. Um, it's typical for a big company to then go to the government and say, look, we need to, for the protection of consumers, of course, we need to set standards. We need to set minimum standards, right? That uh, says, you know, whatever widgets we sell, you know, they need to look like this and they need to come with these and these and these safety protocols and blah, blah, blah. Set the standard across the industry, right? Because big business knows that they already meet that standard. Right, so they, they don't really have an issue with it. Right? They also already employ a, 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 an entire floor full of lawyers and compliance officers. So th- it's really not a biggie for them. But they know that it keeps smaller competitors out of the market. Right? It stops innovation or it reduces innovation. Right? Because innovators can't go and say, well, hang on, we don't actually need that, that standard. We can, we can go around it in all sorts of ways. And we can do all sorts of new innovative things. Um, like what Netflix is doing, going over the internet, uh, you know, with with, with content. Um, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it, it wasn't really possible to stream content like that. Um, now it is, and it's great. You know, it's wonderful. Uh, but now, now multi-choice comes and says, oh, but this competes with us now, so, you know, we've got to do something to stop that. We've got to set some standards here. Um, they're just doing what big business does altogether. And, you know, it's like, Post offices don't need protection against email. You know, horses don't need protection against motor cars. Um, you know, if these old companies cannot adapt to new technology and to changing demand in the market and, and changing conditions, well, then they should die. You know, it's adapt or die in the market. And, and that is how the market actually makes sure that people do get what they want. Right? They do get the cheaper option that they prefer in Netflix. Um, rather than rather than being forced to pay 900 rand or something for for multi choice uh, for DSTV, you know, and getting forced to to watch I don't know 90% local content on SABC, you know, cloudy cloudy Motswaneng TV. Um, it's it's stop protecting these companies. Stop protecting. Stop stop regulating the market. It's it's you're killing innovation, and that's one of the reasons why South Africa keeps lagging behind the rest of the world. You know, we've got government that just puts so many shackles on everything, so many regulations on everything, tries to control the economy, and it just doesn't work. And that's why people look overseas and go, whoa, they have cool data, cool cool data prices. You know, they have such cool products there. They have so much choice there. Um, Why can't we have that? Well, we can't have that because of our government, because of our government regulation. Um, And that needs to end. I don't think we can have you back on the podcast either because you just gave the government another idea for an SABC channel. So I think that this will be your first and final <laughs> appearance on the, on the channel. Uh, but on that note, Ivo, we have to thank you for your time and your expertise and your insights today. Thank you very much for coming on. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. We will definitely have, I think, the, the debate around anarchism and uh, limited government and that kind of thing. I mean, there's only one correct position, the objective, the objectivist position. So we'll have to, how, we'll have to like hash this out how, at some point. How is Anarch- tyranny a correct position? There's only one correct position uh, okay. and it's anarchy. <laughs> Anything Anarch- else anarchism. is tyranny. Anarchism versus minarchism. Yes, that's a very, no, no, it's, an old, it's a very old libertarian yeah. debate. <laughs> yes, I think we should do that sometime. Um, viewers and listeners, thank you, of course, for joining us once again. Um, please rem- remember to like the video. Please share it on your different social media platforms while the government still allows you to. And if you haven't yet, please also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We greatly appreciate all of your support. We currently have um, a fundraiser going on at the moment. You can go to www.freemarketfoundation.com and click on the banner um, on the main page. It's our 1 million rand annual fundraiser and we would greatly appreciate your support to continue funding the work that we do advocating for policies and ideas that uh, will strengthen all South Africans' property rights, um, strengthen the rule of law, uh, consumer rights, correctly understood, economic freedom. Yeah, all of, all of that um, we will continue to do. If you want to find any of our articles, please go to our website as well. You will find those 
on the homepage. Um, next week, we have two episodes, two live episodes coming up. So remember to set reminders for that one on the expropriation bill. And then one on the day after the budget, uh, we'll be analyzing what Minister Tito Mbueni has, uh, what miracles he has performed with tax revenue uh, this year. Uh, for now, we will say have a good weekend. Take care out there and we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.